Stephen Rogers, and I am a faculty member at Harvard Business School. Uh, I am a, uh, uh, a faculty member, a professor, where I teach entrepreneurial finance and a new course that I introduced this past semester titled Black Business Leaders and Entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. It's a course that was created in response to a problem that we have at Harvard Business School and of every other graduate business school in America, and that is uh, the exclusion of black businessmen and women in the curriculum. Uh, at Harvard Business School, we are the primary producer of case studies that are sold throughout the world, teaching students about business challenges. In fact, we have produced at Harvard Business School approximately 10,000 case studies. Uh, my count shows that less than 70 of those case studies have black protagonists. Therefore, I'm an alum of Harvard Business School, I have an MBA. Uh, I found it to be an embarrassment uh, that we are not teaching our students anything about the brilliance of black businessmen and businesswomen. And in fact, what I say is we have almost a segregated curriculum where blacks are not included, and therefore we have a big hole in our curriculum. It's like a donut with a big hole in it. And the hole is the absence of black people being taught um, about, uh, excuse me, black people being highlighted in terms of their brilliance as well as other people throughout the world. So the course was created to, to, to address that problem, and that is to write case studies and then to teach the subject matter of black business brilliance uh, to students um, who are ideally black as well as students of any other race or, or ethnicity. Um, the course is about black business people making business decisions, and uh, they include people like Lonnie Johnson, a NASA engineer who created the Super Soaker gun, that they sold a billion, uh, uh, billion items uh, over the last few years. But it's chock full of case studies about great black businessmen and women who are not athletes and who are not entertainers. We do not talk about them. And so what we talk about are black businessmen and women who've embraced education, black businessmen and women who have business challenges such as how do they grow their firm, how do they uh, procure uh, venture capital, how do they uh, take their company public, um, and as well as our cases also have some black history uh, associated with the case. So a case that you read about uh, one of uh, Otis Gates, for example, will tell you about uh, the Pullman Porters, who was Otis Gates' father was a Pullman Porter. And Pullman Porters was one of the most distinguished jobs that black men could have in the 1920s. So we'll give the history of that. Uh, we just have a case about um, Herman Bulls. Herman graduated from West Point University, uh, West Point United States Military Academy. He taught there as well. That case will not only talk about Herman's decision to start his own real estate business, but it will also talk about the history of blacks at West Point, where the first black, um, Flipper, uh, Henry Flipper, um, was a former slave, and when he matriculated to West Point, uh, during his four years there, no student ever spoke another word to him. Um, so we'll talk about uh, uh, the history of blacks at West Point, also including the Buffalo Soldiers. See, you asked me a short question, I'll give you a long answer. Yeah, the way that it relates to African business leaders is the fact that uh, they will be included. They have, they were, I did not include them in my first round of case studies. I stayed stateside. But the next round of case studies will have African businessmen and women that are included as well. Um, and the, one of the reasons is because even the case studies at Harvard Business School and the case studies that have been published and taught, when they talk about a case study that has Africa, it's always the most negative aspects of Africa. Again, the focus will be on the uplifting, the celebrating, and the recognizing of great African businessmen and women. And what we won't do is we will not write case studies about people uh, black African or African American uh, business leaders who have not given something back to the community. That's one of the keys, one of the ways in which we define success of our business leaders, and that is they must not only be successful monetary-wise for themselves, but they must have something else that they can say about what they've done to uplift the black community in their countries. The other way that I would say this is important to Africa is because probably a tenth, excuse me, 25% of my students in my class are from the diaspora. They're from Africa. 
and uh, they're wonderful students and they come from our business school, our uh, school of politics, they come from our medical school, our engineering school. And so um, with my students, we have, and I am actually training what I believe are the next generation of African students on the topic of having entrepreneurial success and giving back and uplifting your community. And I'm hopeful that those African students will come back to the continent and apply what they've learned. I've been teaching for 22 years, and this was a new course that I taught, and I was passionate about creating this course. And it turned out this is the best course I've ever taught in my life. And the reason was because it was all black students. I had such a great experience teaching brilliant black, young black men and women about brilliant black men and women. And it was beyond what I ever expected. And um, I'll teach it again uh, next semester. I don't know if I'll have the same experience, but that's fine. I've had that great experience one. It's like having that first high and then trying to uh, re-experience it. But it was a fascinating experience. And I'm not one who believes that in order to be successful, you have to have white people as part of a thing. That, I, it doesn't bother me whatsoever if I never have uh, other, uh, any students other than black students. I'm perfectly happy with that. I reimagine Africa as a continent that flourishes, that flourishes like I envision this particular country here that we're in today, and that is Ghana. Ghana has had independence for 60 years, and I think it's had its longest. It's the country that has the longest independence out of all the other countries uh, within Africa other than Ethiopia. But I see Ghana on a path of great rebirth, just 60 years old, and look what has happened in this country. I've envisioned that happening throughout the entire continent of Africa. That is governed by blacks, for blacks, and that Africa's wealth will be created uh, probably with the assistance of non-blacks, but blacks will control everything. It is imperative that Africa, in my opinion, not let uh, white business people take this country over and be, uh, excuse me, take the continent over and basically be at the head of, of the economic ladder in every aspect. So how do you do that? I'm an investor, I own property in the Bahamas. And it's a black country. And one of the things that I love about it is black people run the country. And they've developed the Bahamas where I am. But the development has come from outside capital with the condition that you can build here, but you can't stay. That you can build here and we want our own people to be employed. So if there are skill sets that we don't have, you can bring somebody from the outside, but they must train our people and then your person must leave in three years. That's my vision of Africa, quite frankly. Um, I'm hopeful that that model will be instituted here because I, as I've driven around Ghana, one of the things that struck me was the beautiful coastal lines here. And the coastal lines are such that any place else in the world, you look at them and you say, that's just prime real estate. And what I know is gonna happen, and this is what I said to my girlfriend as we were driving, I said, 10 years from now, I believe that's gonna be developed in beautiful condominiums, beautiful hotels. And I'm hopeful that those people who presently live in those coastal areas who are uh, stricken with poverty, poverty, I hope they're taken care of in a humane manner such that they can take care of themselves and displaced in a place uh, where it's respectful, uh, their, li their lives are improved. But I'm also hoping that those new places that end up on those coastal areas, the new Africa that I envision and that I imagine, are places that are controlled by black Africans and that the black community is the beneficiary of that development. The three things that I need to achieve that objective are, one, I need to be invited uh, to do so. I need to be invited to various countries throughout the continent of Africa. I need a, a support system of some kind that says, you know what, what you're doing is such that we want this to go throughout the entire continent. Um, oh, and I'm a pretty doggone good professor. I won Professor of the Year over 25 times. 
Uh, and I'm a worldwide recognized professor. And one of my shames, one of my embarrassments, one of my disappointments is I have not been able to share that brilliance with African, the African community in the African continent. Um, so I'm hopeful of finding a sponsor that will enable me to travel throughout the continent of Africa as well as bring a contingent of other African Americans and other African brothers and sisters who are in Africa to help me with the teaching. Uh, the final thing that I need is um, I just need a chalkboard or a whiteboard to do the instructing. Africa in the future is to continue what I'm doing in terms of uh, adding Africans as protagonists in case studies, uh, teaching African students, and then being available uh, if I'm offered the opportunity or invited to come back and participate. I, I would like to say one of the things, this has been one of the most gratifying experiences of my, of my life uh, visiting Ghana. And it's been gratifying in, in, in the sense that one is, I'm a very uh, black-centric man. Uh, I'm known in the United States as a race man. And a race man, that phrase came about and was uh, coined by uh, people who said, race people are people who are interested in the uplifting of their own race. So I'm a race man, and I happen to matriculate uh, to the best business school in the world, Harvard Business School, where I presently teach. I've been an entrepreneur, and so my uh, desire is to use all the gifts that God has given me to uplift black people in America, to uplift black people in Africa, and to uplift back black people throughout the entire world. You know, entrepreneurship, one of the beauties of entrepreneurship, I like to say entrepreneurship is a synonym for freedom. Um, successful high growth entrepreneur uh, results in people having the opportunity to do something great. And that something great is they have the opportunity to create jobs for other people. So when I look at countries like Ghana, when I look at continents like Africa, I say that they, it's imperative that the continent embraces uh, the importance of entrepreneurship, not just simply in what we call the lifestyle category of entrepreneurship. That's people who just work on their own in a mom and pop kind of business for the purpose of generating income. What we need in the continent of Africa, we need high growth entrepreneurs. High growth entrepreneurs are people who create large meaningful size companies that creates large numbers of people. So for the continent of Africa to be what it's gonna be in the future, it is imperative that entrepreneurship be embraced, that entrepreneurship be financed, that entrepreneurship be taught in a way that lets people know that this is one of the ways in which we will ultimately really truly get our freedom. And we'll get our freedom because what entrepreneurs do who are successful, they create jobs for other people. And people who have jobs are self-sufficient, and self-sufficient people live in healthy communities. What a beautiful phrase to apply to the continent of Africa in terms of the model that's needed for the uplifting of a country uh, like Ghana, for the uplifting of a continent like Africa that has been raped of its resources in the past and now is playing catch up. The only way that we can catch up as black people in the continent of Africa is we have to employ and embrace entrepreneurship. But we need help. This continent didn't get into the problem that it has by itself. This continent got into the problem that it has because others came from outside of the continent and stole resources. Imagine what Africa could be today if those things never happened. We only had 60 years of independence of Ghana but we're making great progress, and that great progress is coming uh, as a result of entrepreneurs who are uplifting themselves as well as uplifting their communities. Well, I would say that the primary thing that you can take away from our cases is what I taught today in my session, and that is that one must embrace, embrace the theory of strategy. Strategy means how are you different? To be successful as an entrepreneur, you must be different. One of the things that I experienced when I was here in Ghana, I visited the brothers and sisters over at the Arts Center. And they're chock full of independent uh, business people selling African garb, as well as African mask and art. I went to one brother who was owner of a shop and I said, what is different about your shop than the shop that's right next to you? He paused, he thought about it and he said, I don't know. 
So one of the takeaways that I want you to, to have is, it is imperative that people think strategically, which means they have to think about how they're different. That's one of the lessons that is in the, the, the foundation of the course that I teach with all black entrepreneurs. The second one is this, that it's imperative that black people, be they in Ghana or in my country where I hail from, Guinea, or any other part of the African continent, that black people em embrace finance. Our stereotype is that we don't like numbers. We must fight that stereotype. We must embrace the importance of finance, and in particular, entrepreneurial finance. I sit in front of you today as a man who majored in history in college. Today, I teach entrepreneurial finance at the best business school at the world, in the world. Finance is not brain surgery. And one of the joys that I get, I'll leave here, and on Monday, I will go back to Chicago, and I will fly to Memphis, Tennessee. And on Tuesday, I will teach 100 black entrepreneurs in Memphis, Tennessee about the fundamentals of entrepreneurial finance. And it's one of the greatest joys that I ever have to have people who say, I am a business owner, but I've always been afraid of the numbers. And when they leave my class, they say, now I love the numbers. That's what African entrepreneurs must also experience and embrace. It's a great question. How can people outside the continent help and help to build Africa? The reality is one of the, the great things that has happened in America, for example, outside of the continent is there's an organization called the National Association of Investment Companies. That is a trade association that represents the venture capital industry that is controlled by black Americans and who invest in black-owned companies. So that is a great way right there for outsiders outside of the continent to be a part of the development of Africa, and that is the alliance and the partnership of entities that have a vested interest and explicitly say, I want to invest in black people. So that's one way. The other way is, in my opinion, is um, people like myself have to be invited to be a part of the educational process. Um, and I would strongly encourage that. The program that I mentioned to you right now that I'm gonna be doing in Memphis, that's a program that was founded by a Harvard Business School professor, it's a white professor, who focuses on urban entrepreneurship. A similar program should be created for Africa, where a collection of professors and that's what happens. It's a whole collection of us who teach four days, these people, um, entrepreneurs in America, four days where we go probably to 20 different cities traveling around. That kind of model needs to be applied there. If I had, you asked me three questions, I've told my brothers and sisters there, I want to pull together a team of people that I bring to Africa, and we go through from country to country teaching four and five days of the fundamentals of high growth business. So that's a way. The other way that I would really uh, uh, emphasize as well is, and this is for uh, whites as well as blacks, and that is making access to capital available. We can't do this by ourselves. The continent of Africa cannot do this by ourselves. We need outside financial resources. And it's not begging. It's asking for, for one degree, uh, one instance is asking for uh, people to invest in companies they can give market rate returns. And then in some instances, to some degree, is asking for reparations. And I'm a strong advocate of that, okay? Um, so those would be the ways in which I would say uh, that outsiders can uh, help the continent of Africa. Yeah. My primary objective is to travel the world. This is my first trip to the continent of Africa. I've been saying I need to come to Africa, and I've typically when I go to different countries, I go because somebody's invited me to come to teach or something. But this is my first trip to Africa. What I'm hopeful of, this won't be my last trip to Africa. And what I'm hopeful of with that uh, continue future trips to Africa, that I'm constantly in the business of educating the next generation of Africans in the, Africans in the business of entrepreneurship, the fundamentals of entrepreneurship, the fundamentals to finance entrepreneurship. In America, at Harvard Business School, we have a program for business owners, and it's called OPM, Owners, President, and Managers. These are people who own companies 
that have at least $10 million of revenue. When I teach in that program, I teach finance, entrepreneurial finance, the African brothers and sisters who are in that program, and they typically, if there's a class of 180 students, 20 of them will be from the continent of Africa. But those 20 African students come down before I actually ever teach a word in the class, and they uh, surround me with joy and happiness to see a black face teaching, but also realizing that my interest is helping them learn the fundamentals of finance that enables them to be successful as businessmen and women. So my vision, my role in this, is to be an instructor that helps people uh, develop the fundamentals of entrepreneurship, and in particular, entrepreneurial finance.